morning, everyone. Good evening. Morning. Yeah. Um, so we are very happy to have Ajahn Punadamo, the abbot of Arrow River Hermitage, on the uh, Clear Mountain uh, podcast conversation. And uh, I'll just start by reading a, a short biography of uh, Tanajan. So Ajahn Punadamo is the abbot of Arrow River Forest Hermitage in Northern Ontario, Canada. Born in Toronto in 1955, at the age of 23, he began studying Buddhism under Kema Ananda, the founder and first teacher of the Arrow River Center. In 1990, at the age of 35, Ajahn Punadamo ordained into the Ajahn Chah forest tradition in Thailand and stayed there for the next five years, largely based at Wat Ba Nana Chat, the International Forest Monastery. After his fifth year in robes, his teacher Kema Ananda contracted lung cancer and with death imminent, he asked Ajahn Punadamo to return to Canada to assume management of the Arrow River Center. Ajahn Punadamo returned with the blessing of his seniors in the order in November of 1995 and was able to spend time with his beloved teacher before his death. Since its founder's passing, Arrow River Hermitage, Forest Hermitage has continued as a place of practice and refuge for both monastics and lay visitors with Ajahn Punadamo as its abbot. Ajahn Punadamo is the author of uh, the extensively researched The Buddhist Cosmos, a comprehensive survey of the early Buddhist worldview according to Theravada and Sarvastivada sources, uh, Letters to Mara, which is an insightful and creative allegory in the spirit of C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters, and many other writings which can be found at www.arrowriver.ca. So thank you so much, uh, Ajahn, for agreeing to uh, have this conversation with us. Um, so one thing which I'm, I'm curious to uh, ask about is actually your, your poly learning. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's abundantly clear uh, reading the Buddhist cosmos and in your talks that you've uh, spent a lot of time studying Pali, reading Pali texts, and uh, I'm curious how that process went for you. Did, had you done any study before ordaining, or is all of your study? Uh, it was, well, I, I don't like to over-exaggerate my Pali, Pali knowledge. I'm, I'm, I can work my way through a Pali text laboriously. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not real fluent, but uh, I do have, I, I do basically understand the grammar and I have a decent vocabulary. Um, I, I never really had formal training in it. I started studying Pali in my early years as a monk with um, A.K. Warder's Introduction to Pali. I worked my way through that and I've you know, gone from there. Uh, one thing that helped me in, um, was that when I was in high school, I studied Latin for two years. And that has basically the same grammatical structure. So uh, uh, that was like a big hurdle. Many people studying Pali, the first big hurdle is getting used to the declensions. Um, where I already had that knowledge buried somewhere in, in the back of my mind from studying Latin for two years. And have you found that, um, like how, in what way has the, your Pali study supported your, your actual practice of meditation or your living of the, the holy life, practicing the teachings? I think quite a bit um, in that it, uh, having some knowledge of Pali helps to clarify the teachings. And one thing that I often bring up in my Dhamma talks is the uh, misleading translations in English that a lot of the common terms in Pali are, are, have um, English, standard English translations that are not quite right. And they bring in uh, all kinds of um, false ideas and, and confuse the actual meaning. It, and it's not, it's not that the translation is wrong as such, it's just there is no English word exactly right. So the translators do the best they can. But some of these uh, words have gotten to be standardized and people relying solely on the English word often have a um, misinterpretation of the teaching. 
what, what's a particular problematic term you found long for with the ones where you feel are the most yeah a the most difficult a very very good example is uh, some of the terms around um, samatha meditation and jhana um, particularly samadhi which is commonly translated as concentration and i think that's very wrong and i think that's that's actually was a wrong choice to become standardized it's what i find with people uh, that i'm teaching meditation a common mistake people make is to force the mind too hard and the part of this comes from the use of language and talking about concentrating the mind it's like you you know you're putting an effort and you're narrowing the mind down you know? whereas the the mind in jhana is actually vast and expansive it's the equivalent of a brahma deity's mind which can contemplate thousands of world systems so it's not a narrow little point right so samadhi should be translated really as stability or stillness and that's actually how it's in texts like the Vasudhi Maga and in the Abhidhamma where they expand on the term that that those are the words they use non-wavering stillness stability yeah. a similar one is uh, related is uh, ikagata for one of the jhana factors which is translated one pointedness whereas I, I prefer to say um, gone to unity or unified mind yeah, those are those are great examples as you refer to uh, buddha gosa or the abhidhamma um, that's something which is also apparent in reading your buddhist cosmos is that you've read a lot of the commentaries and these are things which a lot of people don't know about um, and are even even though they don't know about them you know people who are somewhat interested in in buddhism they've got somewhat of a, a protestant bias against um, yes. you know paracanonical literature of yes. which they include the, the Abhidhamma. And you've obviously read a lot of commentaries. And I'm curious if you, um, which either haven't been translated into English or if they have aren't widely read. And I'm curious about your your own, how you found that the commentaries, Buddha Gosas or Abhidhamma commentaries have supported yeah. your own practice. Um, well, uh, the main support is the, is a clarification of the teachings like if a lot of the um uh if you're trying if you are as i did several passages in buddhist cosmos if you're trying to translate from the suttas uh very often it's it's difficult to uh determine the actual intent or meaning of, of a phrase without referring to the commentaries the commentaries will will um, provide a um, clarification of many many obscure points and i think you can see that in uh, if you um using um bhikkhu bodhi's translations uh, he does he's very well uh studied in in the commentaries and things and and if you look at his footnotes he'll often refer to the commentaries to clarify a, a, a ambiguous phrase yeah he does he does recommend that um have you how how have you read the commentaries have you um just like dipped in you know here and there as you're interested or have you actually picked up um or looked at digital poly reader and you know read commentaries from beginning to end just out of curiosity i would say more like the former it's, it's like when I'm when I'm um, researching something. Uh, often I'll go I'll go to the commentaries to uh, you know for that passage to 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 clarify it. Which the um, uh, n you know nowadays with the what we, uh, resources we have available in terms of software uh, uh, like the digital poly reader. It makes it so much easier to dip into and cross-reference the, the commentaries and sub-commentaries. Yeah, in, in the Buddhist cosmos, you you kind of you reference or refer to often these these commentaries. And I think you've you've done some translation. Have you ever translated full 
commentarial um, excerpts or? Well, yeah, yeah, there's several of them in Buddhist cosmos. Um, I, I translated, a, a, for example, a long passage about the um, wheel turning monarch that I believe has never been translated or published translation before. I'm not aware of one. You know, there's a few like that. That was probably the longest one I did. And also another one um, dealing with uh, Uturakuru, the northern continent. That was another lengthy translation. Yeah, I find there are a lot of, of gems, you know, hidden hidden in the commentaries, gems in for us, you know, in that uh, yeah. hidden for us, and that they haven't really been translated into English yet. So, yeah. yeah another thing um, is just your you have a, on your YouTube channel uh, a whole series of lectures on Abhidhamma, which mm -hmm. is another uh, area of the Dhamma, which you know there are certain groups in the West which have kind of take Abhidhamma as some of their focus, but I find your talks very approachable. And I'm curious if, uh, if you find your, the way that you hold Abhidhamma supportive for your practice, or it, did you study it mostly to get an intellectual understanding because it's one of the three pitakas or uh, what's your relationship to Abhidhamma? Well, it's very much uh, supportive of practice. Um, uh, because uh, it it uh, clarifies it clarifies what's going on in the mind. Now, you you notice that um, in Myanmar, uh, it's the uh, the heartland of uh, vipassana meditation, and also of abhidhamma studies, because the two go hand in hand. One is the the practice, and the other is the theory. And it, it gives you a, um, you know, if you have some knowledge of Abhidhamma, it gives you a better clarity and precision in understanding the processes of the mind that you can observe directly through Vipassana. Could you maybe say more about that? How they, how they go hand in hand? Because it's not uh, so apparent to me. I know other teachers, maybe even in the Ajahn Chah tradition who are, uh, you know, skeptical of Abhidhamma or, or yeah. practitioners like Ajahn Buddha Dasa, you know, sometimes people will quote him and I haven't seen the original Thai, but, you know, they say that uh, Buddha Dasa would, um, you know, discourage study of the Abhidhamma saying, what is the translation of Abhidhamma? You know, Dhamma and Abhi means too much. So Abhidhamma is just too much mm -hmm. Dhamma. Yes. Yeah, that, I think it, uh, Thais generally like to play with these kind of, uh, creative translations. Um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, there is, a, there is a caution to be had about uh, relying solely on intellectual definitions. And that, that can become, you know, that can become a, a trap, you know, if you, um, uh, you know, like the Zen people talk about mistaking the finger for the moon, right? Another analogy I've heard is um, you can read a cookbook all day long and it won't uh, satisfy your hunger. Okay? Uh, but there is, a, there is, I think, um, a practical benefit in, in knowing Abhidhamma it, if it's taken hand in hand with direct meditative experience that, that becomes... One of the things I think that's... Um, missing from many people's uh, vipassana practice is precision uh, so people sometimes talk about uh, developing um, open awareness or general awareness and what that often means in practice is just the mind is very fuzzy and unfocused and you know it can feel good but you're not really examining the mind and um uh, the proper vipassana is being aware of dhammas as they arise and if you've got an intellectual framework to be able to know and understand what those dhammas are it can it can help the process along can you think of any specific examples i i know i heard recently that um 
apparently, according to Abhidhamma, um, at least one of the four Brahma Viharas, so loving kindness, compassion, uh, altruistic joy, or equanimity, is present in every kusala mind state. Mm-hmm. That was that seems like a, a practical insight or practical yeah, yeah. perspective. Do you have yeah. any any other instances which you could bring up? Well, one I can, yeah, one that comes to mind is something that struck me uh, early on when I first started studying Abhidhamma, and it. Uh, it and it, it's that in, uh, in um, if, if the feeling tone, the Vedana of um, unhappiness, domanasa or uh, dukkha arise in the mind, it's always associated with an unskillful mind state. And that was, that, that was early on. I, I, that's one of the things that is sort of, at first it doesn't seem, my first reaction to it was, no, that can't be right. You know, you gotta. Sometimes you gotta feel feel bad about something. But you know, the, then the more I contemplate on it, the more sense it made that um, there's there's an unskillful there's an unskillful mind state associated with every moment of unhappiness. So that that's actually a very powerful insight. Yeah, that is, that's that's quite powerful. Uh, yeah, on a daily, on a daily level, in in meditation or not. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, there's so many things to uh, to ask about, and our, our time is somewhat limited. One one other thing I did want to ask about uh, before passing it over to Tan Nisabo um, is actually on the topic of creative writing. I mean, your letters to Mara are just a joy to read, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I'm I'm curious what your process is when you um, yeah decide to write some kind of dhamma dhamma fiction or, or dhamma dhamma narrative and uh, how that supports your own practice and uh, if you feel that it can do so for other people and if so uh, how might one go about that writing process? Um. Oh, well, I don't. I don't think I've got a, any magic formula for for uh, for writing. Um, I generally I generally start with a kind of outline, but it may not even be written down, but it's clear in my mind, a kind of broad structure. And then the first uh, first pass of writing, I do it pretty much, you know, stream of consciousness, just go and just write something and then go back to it a day later and edit it and revise it and make it polished and that's the um that's basically how i how i do any kind of of my writing um and do you find that the process of writing actually helps your thinking process and or your meditation process yeah well i find this with um not just with writing, but even with verbal teaching, um, that uh, it it really clarifies the you know my own thinking. If I if I'm trying to explain something, then I have to clarify it in my own mind and be clear about it. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for those answers and quite practical advice as well. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, your, the first thing I ever encountered from you was your Buddhist cosmology book and um, just not something you see spoken a a lot in spirit rock circles and elsewhere. Um, I'm very curious about, you know, looking, um, when you read about the sort of variegated you know, world which Buddhist cosmology really depicts, it's it's interesting to find that a lot of the figures are echoed across cultures. Um, right, yeah. What comes to mind are like the, you know, the Asur, uh, the Titans and the Greek gods and the Asuras and the Tavatinsa Devas, the Thunderbirds of Native American literature and the Garudas. Yes. yes. What, what, do you, what other resonances have you sort of seen across cultures and mythologies that have uh, interested you? Uh, well, the the you you mentioned some of the, the main ones, but the um, the Bumadevas, uh, 
you know, the, the little dewas of the forests and trees and so on, there, there's some variance, variation of that in many cultures. They have the, the, uh, the Sith in, um, in Celtic culture, you know, the, the fairy people. And in uh, Native America, they have the, the little folk in the forest. Um, it's, that's quite a common, uh, common theme. Um, the Nagas, the, I mean, giant serpent beings, dragons of some kind or another are pretty universal. You have European dragons and Indian Nagas and Chinese dragons. Um, there's several, there's several, uh, uh, several things like that, that we can find. I think as far as that, um, the, the, uh, the battle between the Dewas and the Asuras, you, you referenced the, the Greek gods and the Titans, there's the Norse gods and the, uh, the storm giants. But I, I've, got, I've got a theory or an idea that um, the Tawatinksa level of the cosmology is uh, a common inheritance of all the Aryans. So India, Greece, Nor uh, Norse, you know, um, because the similarities are so strong, I think that particular pantheon is the, the Roman, Greek, and Norse pantheon. So, Lumpur, um, how do you, you know, I, I imagine many people listening um, or watching may not um, know how to either share the explicit belief in these things um, or even if they do, or even if they don't know how they would use this to any real effect in their practice or lives, what would you say to, you know, the skeptics and, um, how would one, you know, how do you, yeah. how do you find this informs your practice as well in terms of that vision? Well, uh, a couple of things I can say about that. One is, um, to, to ask the question, are these, uh, are these beings in these realms real is actually a kind of a naive question because first you need to clarify exactly how real is this human realm and in what sense. Um, so, you know, it depends what you mean by real. Um, in terms of, of practice, it is in the Vasudhi Maga, one of the uh, 40 meditations is uh, contemplation of Dewas. And uh, the last few years, I've been experimenting with that myself, doing uh, meditating on the different Dewa realms. And I find that it, it um, raises the level of consciousness. Like you imaginatively put yourself into higher planes of consciousness. And it, 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 um, you know, it, it lifts uh, the consciousness above the human plane. Chan, could you say more about that? I know the, I mean, in the, the textual description of what Devanu Sati, your recollection of the Devas is, it's quite formulaic, just thinking, oh, they had morality. I yeah, have morality I too. Or, but how have you been practically hmm. uh, applying that? Well, I go through, I start with um, uh, imagining, it's, it's, a, it's like a meditative imagination, a, med a meditation of the imagination. Okay. I start by imagining the um, the earth plane dewas and the nagas and so on, and bring it up through the the different heaven realms. You know, then the chatumaharajika, the four great kings, and and tawatinksa, and just kind of visualize being there in the different realms. And um, I'll take it up to uh, first Brahma level. And sometimes I'll go beyond that and go into the higher Brahma realms. Yeah. Do you have images associated with those long poor, or is it sort of just what comes yeah. to mind? Well, it, yeah, it's visualization. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I you know I am I have um, I have uh, you might say stock images that I that I have for the different realms that I bring up. Lumpur, another question uh, we had was 
in our, we had a great discussion with Ajahn Sona around sort of Buddhist resonance and influence in history, mm -hmm. uh, where we, we spoke about, you know, the possible fact, you know, Socrates having jhana, perhaps, and I know, I believe he, I'd recommended the shape of ancient thought to him, and I think he sent it to you as the... No, I, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, okay, never mind, but I, regardless, I'm curious if you had any, um, you know, places where you see, apart from just the mythology, uh, mm -hmm. Buddhist resonance or, or influence in European or Greek or Mediterranean uh, yeah. circles. Yeah, I think in Greek philosophy, there's some, um, in the, the Neoplatonists, uh, there, there, there's some, uh, definitely some Indian, probably Buddhist influence in their, in their thinking. And some of that got into Christianity through um, uh, the Gospel of John, you know, is has a kind of a, that, that opening passage about the, in the beginning was God and um, the word, the word was God and the word was with God. And the word in Greek for word is uh, logos, which could also mean mind. Right? So it's, uh, that has been interpreted by some people as having Buddhist influence. That's possible. Uh, 